Welcome back to Coach Hall Writes. Today's video is the first video in a new series that I'm doing on my channel. It's called Class with Coach Hall, and for this part of the series, we're going to be practicing rhetorical analysis. More specifically, we're going to be looking at Obama's 2013 commencement speech at Morehouse College. The idea behind this series is to provide lessons for students. And so because of that, if you would like to follow along with the lesson, there are going to be times during the video where I cue you to pause the video. That way you can write down your own responses. If you would like some slides that correspond with the videos, then check out the description box below. Before I forget, don't forget to like this video and make sure that you're subscribed. Now let's move on to the lesson. The speech that we're looking at is going to be a commencement speech. A commencement speech is given at a graduation ceremony. At college graduation ceremonies, especially for prestigious colleges, they typically invite a celebrity, a politician, or a famous alum to give the keynote address. We're going to begin by doing a bit of an anticipation activity. We know that a commencement speech is a speech given at a graduation ceremony. In these speeches, the speaker typically aims to celebrate the accomplishments of the graduating class and encourage or advise the graduates as they embark on their next steps after graduation. If you'd like to participate with this video, then I'd like you to try to brainstorm three possible tone words for a commencement speech. If possible, try to include the adjective form of the word. When you're done, I want you to think of three possible verbs that could convey the purpose of a graduation speech. Try to think of verbs other than encourage or advise, but it is okay if they're synonyms of those verbs. If you're participating with the lesson, go ahead and hit pause now, and when you're ready, resume the video. Here are some possible answers. Now keep in mind, these are just possible answers. So if what you put is not on this list, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. In fact, if you have a great answer that you think I forgot, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. As far as tone words, we could say that the speech could be inspiring or inspirational, motivating or motivational, or even uplifting. Commencement speeches are not a somber occasion. Therefore, the tone words listed here fit most, if not all, commencement speeches. Now, as far as purpose, we could say that the purpose is to guide or lead the graduates. The purpose might also be to uplift or to even rally the graduates. It could also be to support the graduates. And lastly, we have inspire or motivate. I definitely gave you more than three purpose verbs there, but part of the reason why I like to do this activity with commencement speeches is because sometimes it's helpful to think of alternative tone words and purpose verbs. That way we're not tempted to reuse the same words over and over again in our writing. Before we actually look at the passage, we're going to talk about the rhetorical situation. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute, what is the rhetorical situation? It's actually composed of six different elements. The speaker, audience, context, exigence, purpose, and message or argument. All of these components work together within the passage. For those of you that are familiar with the acronym Space Cat, the space part of Space Cat is the rhetorical situation. Or if you've heard of Soapstone, the soap part of Soapstone is the rhetorical situation. Understanding the rhetorical situation is important because we need to recognize that our speaker makes certain rhetorical choices based on the rhetorical situation. So let's go ahead and look at the prompt that we're going to be working with. It says on May 19th, 2013, then President Barack Obama delivered a commencement speech at Morehouse College, an all-male, historically black college. Read the excerpt of the speech carefully. In a well-developed essay, analyze how President Obama makes rhetorical choices to convey his message to the graduates. Before we do the activity on the screen, I want to call your attention to a couple things. First of all, take note of the phrase, then president. If something says then president or then senator, it means that the person was in that position at the time that they gave the speech. So in 2013, President Obama was president. Now, if it says former president or former senator, it means that they weren't in that position at the time, but they had previously held that position. Also notice the extra information about Morehouse College. It's an all male, historically black college. That helps us better understand who his audience is. Commencement speeches are directed at the graduates. Now, there might be other people in attendance, for example, the professors or the graduates' families, but the speech itself is aimed at the graduates. One more thing I want to call your attention to is the prompt itself. It says, analyze how President Obama makes rhetorical choices to convey his message to the graduates. 
We'll be talking about rhetorical choices later on in the video. But it's also important to note that we're being asked about his message. Now, this prompt doesn't actually say what the message is. So as we're reading the passage, we want to be thinking about what the message is. In some cases, the message, argument, or purpose is actually provided for you. Whether it is or isn't, it's still important to dig deeper and really think about that message, argument, or purpose as you read. Now, if you're a current AP Lang student, it's important to know that on your exam, you will either be asked about the message, purpose, or argument. The College Board has narrowed it down to those three phrases. Some of the older prompts you encounter might have different phrasing, though. And for the record, because I haven't mentioned it yet, this is not an official College Board prompt. This is just something I created for my students. Okay, now let's get to the activity itself. For this, we want to analyze the relationship between the speaker and the audience. We need to remember that speakers make certain rhetorical choices based on who that audience is. If you'd like to participate in the lesson, go ahead and pause the video now and answer these questions. All right, let's go over the answers. We already mentioned that the speaker is then President Barack Obama. That information was provided in the prompt. Some outside information, though, is that he was the first black president of the United States. Depending on the prompt, you might actually know some outside information about the speaker. But if you don't, don't panic, it's okay. Between the prompt and the passage itself, you have all the information you need to be successful. Now let's look at that second question. It says, what does he likely believe, desire, or value? Given that he is president of the United States, he likely believes in freedom, equality, and American interests or ideals. Also because he's president of the United States, and given that he's speaking at a graduation ceremony, Presumably, he values education and desires a better future for the country. Now, you might be wondering, okay, Coach Hall, why did you ask that question? It wasn't part of the prompt. Here's why. Understanding the speaker's beliefs, desires, or values not only helps us understand the message, but it can also help us understand why a particular speaker made certain choices. We also want to consider the speaker's relationship with the audience. Now, in this case, he's speaking at their graduation ceremony. And technically speaking, he's also their president. So while he doesn't necessarily know them personally, they certainly know who he is. Now let's think about the audience. We know that the audience is the 2013 graduating class of Morehouse College. Because it's an all-male, historically black college, we can assume that the graduates are men, presumably between the ages of 21 and 22, since they're graduating college. We can also assume that they're black or people of color. Given that Obama was the first black president of the United States, and he is also male, there could be a bit of solidarity there between the speaker and the audience. Now let's think about what the audience believes, desires, or values. Since it's their college graduation, presumably they value education. It's also likely that they desire to make a difference or to simply be successful after college. When analyzing a speech, we wanna ask ourselves, is the audience going to be an accepting audience or is it going to be a reluctant audience? We want to think about that because that's going to change the choices that the speaker makes. If it's an accepting audience, then chances are the speaker will have to do less convincing. But if the audience is reluctant, then the speaker is going to want to address that in his or her speech. In this case, since it's a commencement speech and it's the president at the time speaking to a graduating class, we can assume that they're likely excited to listen to his speech and perhaps they admire him. For the final part of our lesson today, we're going to annotate the passage. There are many different annotation techniques out there. For the purposes of this video though, we're going to try to keep it really streamlined. So we're going to do what I call the what and why approach. If you'd like to see my annotations, then go ahead and let the video play through. In the interest of time constraints for this video, I'm not going to read you every paragraph and I'm not going to read you every set of annotations. However, I do want to give you some pointers. First of all, when it comes to the what. So what is the speaker doing? We want to use strong verbs. Using rhetorically accurate verbs helps us to better convey what the speaker is doing, more specifically, the choices that they're making. So in this first paragraph here, as far as the what, I said that he references or quotes Benjamin Mays, who is a former president of the college. So that's what he's doing. As far as why he's doing it, the graduates are likely familiar with Mays. And the quote fits the occasion because it emphasizes the value of honest men rather than just clever men. Keep in mind that Obama is speaking to graduates. These men are educated. Presumably, they now have a bachelor's degree. So in some sense, you could say that they're clever. They're educated, intelligent, smart. You get the idea. But there is a difference between being clever versus being honest. 
And based on the quote, we can tell that being an honest man is important to Mays. The quote highlights civic responsibility and social awareness, not just academic prowess. When it comes to annotations like this, try not to worry too much about grammar or spelling. Really just focus on the what and the why. Now with the why part, don't forget that we're supposed to be thinking about the message. We don't want to lose sight of the rhetorical situation. So for example, you can see that in the second paragraph. The what is that he connects the quote to the college's history. As far as the why, he's trying to establish that the college has a history of graduates who create change. This is a message that these graduates would take pride in and also want to be a part of. Remember how we said that speakers tailor their choices and their message to their audience? This speech is very much tailored to this particular graduating class at this particular college. He could not have given the same speech anywhere else. So by doing that, he's also sort of building a sense of credibility and also trust. If you'd like a chance to look at the rest of the annotations, then go ahead and pause the video. You can see that we continue this technique throughout the rest of the passage as well. One thing that I'd like to point out is the use of strong verbs. So for this top example here, it might be tempting to just say, uses an anecdote. But instead, I chose the phrase, relays a story, because that's a bit of a stronger verb. We also have the verb contextualizes, claims, acknowledges. Now, if you look at the third box down, the why portion, it says, illustrates the importance of being unafraid. Words like illustrates, highlights, suggests, demonstrates, reveals, all of those words are really good words to start off a bullet point for your why. Those words tend to help you lead into some commentary. That's another reason why I like this what and why technique. It is a bit time consuming, and if we're thinking about the exam, I wouldn't expect you to take as detailed annotations. However, it does help to think about not only what the speaker is doing, but why they're doing it, because then you're starting to think about the rhetorical choices and the commentary that you could provide about those rhetorical choices. If you'd like a chance to read the rest of the annotations, please pause the video now. And here is the last portion of the passage that we're looking at. You can see that he builds to a call to action, and the call to action is connected to his message. For most speeches, the call to action is at the end. Speakers build up to it, and part of how Obama builds up to it is by gaining his audience's trust by talking about the history of the college before he directly addresses the graduates. So just as a quick recap, in today's video, we talked about the rhetorical situation and we also annotated the passage. In day two's video, we're going to talk about how to divide the passage up into sections in order to analyze the passage chronologically. We're also going to talk a bit more about rhetorical choices and the rhetorical situation. And we're going to talk about how to write a defensible thesis statement. Thank you so much for watching day one. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that like button and make sure that you're subscribed. Until next time, happy writing.